Last week, we started about talking about the worldview progression, right? Um, how your foundation affects everything that you end up thinking and saying and doing. And then we looked at how the Bible should be our foundation for life, right? How we make decisions, um, what we do. We follow God's commands in scripture. Um, then we looked at the two trees. Was that helpful with the two trees last week? A little bit? You kind of saw the heart underneath both of those, right? Um, what was the main difference between the two trees? The roots. The roots, right. And I'm glad you said roots um, because it wasn't the fruit necessarily. It was the roots. What happened to the tree that had the poor, shallow, weak root system? The tree was all shriveled up and it wasn't bearing fruit. It was shriveled up, not bearing fruit, and it's going to die. die. Yep. What about the stronger tree with the thriving, deep, wide root system? Um, what was, um, what was going to happen to that one? Is going to keep growing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's going to grow. What else? What else, Sarah? Mm-hmm. It's going to bear fruit. Yeah, produces something. It doesn't just sit there and look pretty. <laughs> um, and it's going to do well at, under the pressures of the sun, of the heat, the hard moments of life. So we learned that in the same way, a Christian's heart has been changed by God. Since Jesus has paid the penalty for the Christian girl's sins and chosen her to be saved, she now has a new heart, which allows her to then demonstrate the outward actions of the fruit, the words and the way that she handles her relationships, the way that she um, talks to people, things like that. She looks at everything as being owned by God. So she's like, well, if I'm owned by God, then I need to reflect that in everything that I do. And then finally, we closed last week with noticing that God created us to need relationships um, with other people. He specifically designed us to be in community and to reflect his nature, his community nature um, with the Trinity. And so he gave us other people to live with and be in community together. So today, we're going to look a little bit more at our own hearts and how that's the starting point for dealing with friendships or relationships with people around us. You can't just expect to have good friendships or fix something that went wrong just by hoping that person is less annoying (laughs) or um, just trying to avoid them or trying to um, hope that person starts doing some, some nice things or telling them to do some nice things. No, you have to start with your own heart in the matter. So the first section here. Um, Let's read Jeremiah 17, 9 through 10 together. It says, The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can know it? I, Yahweh, search the heart. I test the inmost being, even to give each man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Now, I think it's kind of funny sometimes how detailed God is in the little things in life. When he made our heart, like our literal aorta heart, he put it like in the center section of our body, right? He didn't put it down by your feet. He didn't put it up by your brain. Like he could have, but he didn't. He put it in the center. And also you can't survive without a heart, at least not for very long. You can have a transplant, but you can't survive without a heart. If if I cut your arm off, <laughs> which I'm not planning to do, um, <laughs> you can still survive, right? You can you can live without an appendix or a gallbladder or a big toe. It's very difficult, but you can make it. You can't survive if you don't have a heart. Your body's going to shut down and eventually die, right? So Jeremiah's words and even just the physical like setup of our bodies show us that our heart is the core of where we are. It's the center. Um, it's the control center, really. And that's one of your blanks there. Your heart is the control center of your spiritual life. It's not only the top or the bottom, it's in the middle of, of your body. It's the control center of who you really are. And if your heart is controlled by anything other than God, it's going to lead to spiritual death. So your heart is the control center of who you really are. And if you fill it with something other than God, it's going to lead to death. So here's some more verses. You can just jot these ones down in that first line there where it says verses to jot down. Um, Romans 3, 10 through 12. 
Romans 3, 10 through 12, Paul is actually quoting Psalm 14. Um, and he says, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There's none who understands. There's none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. There is none who does good. There's not even one. Sheeks. <laughs> that was kind of harsh, right? It's very complete, very definitive. Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Another Romans verse, Romans 6, 23a, first half of the verse says, for the wages of sin is death. What are some examples of things that try to control our hearts that are not from God? Um, kind of like diseases or a virus that tries to creep in and affect us. Well, our homework last week, you kind of might hear some familiarities. Um, there's self-centeredness, which is attention, needing attention or approval from other people. Um, self-rule when you want to be right in a conversation um, or you want to be in control of it. Self-sufficiency, which is like independence and just kind of wanting to be left alone. You want to do it yourself. Self-satisfaction, which is pleasure or comfort or just getting things in life that you want. Stuff. Um, or self-taught, uh, being the smartest person in the room. You have to share your opinion. You have to one-up somebody else's story. So there's a lot of opportunities for our hearts to get off track, right? Um, like the trees analogy, we need someone to come and change our hearts because it's hard enough being a Christian and doing the right thing, right? Let alone not being a Christian. Your heart is, is going through that struggle. So we do need a heart transplant. We need a brand new one. Your identity comes from who you are in your heart. So if you crave those things listed above, the self stuff, then you're going to find your identity in those things, in needing approval, in needing to be in charge, in having to push people away and be alone, in your pleasure, your comfort. You're not going to find your identity in God if you put your identity in those things. Um, and then your life and your conversations and your desires in life are all going to match up with that. Remember the Pharisees? Matthew 23. I'm going to flip to that one. You can listen along or you can jot down Matthew 23, 27 to 28. Says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. In this way, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Their hearts were corrupt, right? They tried to do deeds on the outside to look really good for other people, um, but it was full of pride. It was full of wanting attention or um, approval or whatever those self-centered things were. Their identity was very self-based and Jesus knew their hearts. But if your relationship with Jesus um, is your identity and you're, and you're um, wanting to be a worshiper of him, then you're going to be able to find contentment and joy in life no matter what happens. You won't try to find your identity in controlling or manipulating other people. You'll bite your tongue when you're tempted to defend yourself or prove your point. Um, you'll ask for help or guidance from those that are older and wiser and smarter than you are. You won't get fr frustrated or critical or jealous of other people or um, angry or overly emotional when things don't go your way, right? Your identity is going to change how you act and what you are like. So in other words, a Christian gets her identity from Christ. I believe this is one of your blanks here. A Christian gets her identity from Christ because he has changed her heart through the gospel. And if Christ has changed her heart, then that's going to affect how she relates to other people, how she handles the, the relationships in her life. So instead of self in that homework list, she's going to have a heart that is Christ-centered, Christ-based, Christ-sufficient, Christ-taught, um, Christ-satisfied. 
All right, let's look at the second point. <clears throat> Being a worshiper of God affects your relationships. We are created to be worshipers of God. He made us, so he owns us. Yep. Um, John 17, I want to flip to that one. John 17, 4 and 18. This is the next verse. And John 17 is the prayer that Jesus prays for his disciples. So John 17, 4 says, I glo this is Jesus talking to God the Father. He says, I glorified you on the earth, having finished the work which you have given me to do. So what was his work? Glorifying you on earth, right? That's what Jesus came to do. He came to glorify God, and that happened to mean saving sinners. I glorified you on the earth, completing what you sent me to do. Verse 18, as you sent me into the world, I also sent them into the world. So that's an, that's Jesus' command to us, right? Our job is to be a worshiper, to be a glorifier of God. Um, and then John 20, a couple pages later, John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31 says, therefore, many other signs Jesus also did in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That's an active belief. It's not just a mental, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus because I agree. No, it means that you stake your life on it. You act like it. You do what God's word says. Otherwise, it's not true. That is worship. We're created to be worshipers, to live out lives that glorify God. So not only do we do worship, this is one of your fill-ins, not only do we worship as an action, but first, we are worshipers. It's first our identity, and then it becomes an action and a pattern of our life. Um, and really what we mean when we say we're glorifying God God doesn't need any more glory. He has infinite amount. You can't give him any more. But when we say you glorify God, it means you bring attention to it. You show other people, look at how glorious God is. Look at what he did in my life. Look at what he did in history. Look at what he, who he is. You're bringing attention to God's glory instead of your own glory. He saved us. He changed us, right? Those are wonderful things to bring attention to. Paul Tripp writes this. Only when I am worshiping God for who he is, am I able to love you as you are. Real love and esteem for other people are always rooted in our worship of God. So as we worship God, this one's another fill in. As we worship God, we will love those around us because love is an act of showing worship back to God. Even those people that are really hard to love and that get on your nerves or they're just different than you. When you love them, you're worshiping God. What are some ways we might remind ourselves to love others from our heart? Does that mean we buy them gifts and chocolate and heart balloons and we send them heart emojis and watch a Hallmark movie with them? <laughs> No, that's the world's version of like ooey gooey sticky love. Like, that's not that's not what biblical love is. To love someone sacrificially, um, there's a couple uh, ways that we can we can look at this. Um, and in order to love, uh, let me back up. In order to love others, you have to worship God rightly, right? So in his book, Relationships: A Mess Worth Making, Paul Tripp gives three ways to worship God. And then that's going to help you to love other people. So first, to love you as I should, I must worship God as creator. So your blank there is creator. We need to remember that God made that other person in your life. He designed what they look like, um, how they talk, their little quirks, um, what their preferences are, what their personality is. Um, he made their strengths and even their weaknesses, their skills that they can do. He made each one of you and he made, look around, each one of you, right? He made us all very different. He's creator. And so to worship God as creator says, I can appreciate how God made you and he made you different. And that's a good thing. Second, Mr. Tripp says, to love you as I should, I must worship God as sovereign. 
Our lives are very different than one another's. Even in the same household, we're still very different from each other. We've gone through different experiences, right? So instead of trying to make somebody more like you in your image, which is going to get really frustrating because it's impossible. Um, instead, we need to remind ourselves that God has a purpose for putting people in your life that are different than you. He's teaching us and he wants us to be thankful for those differences. And lastly, um, Paul Tripp says, to love you as I should, I must worship God as Savior. So this means that instead of viewing our friends and our family members as problems when something goes wrong um, and worrying about what they're doing wrong, usually, um, or what they're doing that you don't like, maybe it's not sin, but you just really don't like that. Um, instead, we need to turn around and turn that into an opportunity to say, wow, God has chosen to save me, a sinner. I am so grateful for his, his work in my life that he has saved me. And so I can love those around me, even if they're different. He's working in me, so he must be working in that other person, especially if they're a Christian. If somebody else is a Christian and I see a problem in their life, I can trust God is working on them. They have the Holy Spirit. He's, he's probably on a different timeline than what I think they should be growing in. But other people might be looking at you and thinking the same thing. Why doesn't she do this better? You can look at that and you can take that as a good opportunity. Um, and if that person's not a Christian, then God is still working his plan as well. He's either going to save them or he's going to keep giving them chances until he judges them and says enough is enough, and he's going to expose who they are. But that's not our job. That's God's job. Our job is to keep loving people because God has saved us. Do you see that connection? Like if, you, if you see God as Savior, that's going to help you to view other people, right? That God's working in your life and other people's lives. So wrapping up Romans 12, um, this part, is, I just left it blank if you want to jot anything down that stands out. But I want you to actually kind of flip back to the first page with the Romans notes. Kind of look at that one more time. There's three words that we really didn't touch on that are super important. And you're probably like, why did you skip those? I did it on purpose. This is why. <laughs> um, so verse one. <clears throat> Therefore, I exhort you, brothers, by the mercies of God. So the first word is mercies. Verse three, for through the grace given to me, I say to each one of you. So grace is the second word. And go ahead and like highlight them or circle them or like draw attention to them because they're big deals. Um, so verse three, for the grace given to me, I say to each one of you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound thinking as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. That's the third one is faith. So mercy, grace, and faith. What do each of these words mean? Well, mercy, think of the mercy seat in the Old Testament. Um, it was located in the holiest place of the tabernacle in the temple. And it's where the priest, he'd literally go in and he'd sprinkle blood from the sacrifices all over this fancy box, the, the mercy seat. He would like sprinkle and throw his hands like when you're, you have wet hands in the bathroom and you're trying to just dry your hands by air. He'd like throw the, the blood back onto the, um, onto the mercy seat. It's from the animals that just got slaughtered a few feet away. So mercy is the gift of not receiving the punishment that you deserve. You're supposed to die from every sin that you committed yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You're supposed to die. From every time that you lied or exaggerated the truth, every time you rolled your eyes at your parents, every time that you were angry at a sibling or a cousin or a classmate, every time... Sorry, are you able to repeat that definition? Yeah. It's the gift of not receiving a punishment that you deserve. All right. So we're supposed to die. We're literally supposed to die. But God's mercy means somebody else was put on the altar instead of you. Somebody else was sacrificed instead of you. That's what mercy is. Okay, Grace is undeserved favor, blessing, or overflowing kindness. 
undeserved favor, blessing, or overflowing kindness. So that's like dumping extra blessing on you when, again, you don't deserve it. But it's not necessarily because of the punishment deal. It's, it's more like you're just right here and then God's just going to dump blessing and favor on you. That's, that's grace. They're, they're closely tied, but they're a little bit different. And then faith is the gift to be able to understand that transaction and believe it. So it's the gift to understand what happened with grace and mercy. Understand that transaction and believe it. You have trust or confidence that since God gave you the ability to see and believe, he's not going to abandon you, but he's going to be with you. He's going to fulfill all those promises to you, either in heaven or some of them now. Okay. So what's the point in the passage? Paul tells his readers, listen up. I've been given God's incredible mercies, right? He says, go back to it again, right? By the mercy, I exhort you, brothers, by the mercies of God. You're not on the altar. You're not being slaughtered right now. He says, I've been shown God's incredible mercies. God has not punished us like we deserve, like he should have. So we need to present our bodies as a sacrifice. We're going to actually then turn around and choose to be a sacrifice on that altar, living a living one. We're not going to go kill ourselves, but we're going to be a living, holy, pleasing sacrifice to God as an act of constant worship to him. And then Paul says, don't be like the world. Don't be conformed to it. Don't look like the world. Don't even get close to it or respond or act the way they do. Instead, be transformed. Take a heart transplant. Have a completely new one. Don't just try to brush up and clean the one you have. You need a whole new heart. You need to be transformed. Now, Paul says, by your mind, okay, but that comes from your heart, is what he's implying. You have a new identity in Jesus, remember? So now you can know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. You can approve it. You can figure it out. God will give you that wisdom. And because God has shown such immense grace in my life, verse 3, for through the grace already given to me, I say to you, I'm going to encourage you now, don't be prideful. Don't be puffed up towards others. Don't think you're better. Don't think that they're better and you can never be like them because that's still pride. That's thinking that they're God instead of God being God. No, God has given you the faith to be able to trust his plan. And your job is to love and obey him. And that's what being a true worshiper of God is. So do you see how it all kind of goes back to that heart? You have to look at the heart first. We can see, if we sum it all up, we can see everything points back to needing that changed heart first. You have to be made new by Jesus Christ, and that comes from God's mercy and grace to you and his gift of faith. So with that changed heart, then now your mind gets changed, your thoughts start to think differently, then you're reorienting your life around it. You're speaking words that are differently. You're not saying saying things or talking about things that are not according to scripture. You are speaking about Bible verses and, and the things you're learning. And then you're doing things. You're acting those ways. You're stopping yourself when you're sinning and you're looking different. Um, you're putting yourself on the, on the sacrifice. <laughs> Get my words mixed up. You're putting yourself on the altar of self. It's like you're going to make self die, right? Um, Matthew 16, 24, our last verse here. Um, In fact, I'm not going to even change it. Look at it because it says, take up your cross, deny yourself, choose to die. Jesus has already died for you in the salvation sense, but in a daily sense, make, make your life look like his. Choose to give up the things like perfect friendships or a perfect um, relationship with a boy someday, or a perfect marriage, or being a mom, or being um, whatever it is that, you're, that you might value or, or crave or want, you're going to instead choose to embrace 
who God has always meant you to be because you're looking at what his word says for your life um, and how he created you. That's going to affect who you are, what your identity is. So let's close in prayer here. Lord, we thank you for um, your word. We thank you that you are the one in Romans that changes the hearts. Um, We cannot just transform our mind on our own. We can't change our, our actions. We can't change our words to our family members and our friends. We can't just try to do the right thing. It's always going to fail. We need a new heart, Lord. And for those who are in this room, who have already given their heart to you, that they've already allowed you to change um, their mind and and, um, that you have chosen them and saved them. I pray that they would remind themselves of this truth, that they would not forget it, Lord, but that it would affect everything else. It would color everything else that they do in life. Um, And if they're not sure, Lord, if there's somebody who's not totally sure where she's at, I pray that she'd be honest about that. Um, And, that you would change her heart, that you would transform and give her a heart transplant, Lord, um, so that she can live a life of being a worshiper of you and not a worshiper of self, which is going to lead to death and separation from you forever. We thank you for your word, Lord. We pray that you would remind us of it this week. We ask these things in your name. Amen.